sea and land, habitats that could hardly be more different. Crabs are typical marine inhabitants, but 35 million years ago, they started to conquer the land too. Many of these early conquerors, however, stayed close to the ocean. But some became independent of the ocean and invaded distant, unusual habitats. On the Caribbean island of Jamaica, they colonized the mountainous rainforests deep in the heart of the island. In order to survive, they had to adapt rapidly to their new habitat and change their way of life, in particular their breeding pattern. Eventually, the Jamaica crabs became very successful conquerors. But what made them so successful? For many of us, Jamaica means sunshine, palm trees and sandy beaches. For the Taino, the first inhabitants of Jamaica, the name Tsaimaka meant land of wood and water. Even today, in spite of vigorous deforestation, there are still parts of the island covered with rainforests, in which crystal clear brooks and rivers find their way to the ocean. Jamaica is the youngest of the West Indian islands. Only 12 million years ago did this former coral reef emerge from the ocean. Today, a thick layer of limestone covers large parts of the island. In the course of millennia, rain eroded the limestone, and thus a characteristic karst landscape developed. Several animals and plants that reached the island found ideal habitats where they could freely develop and produced a variety of endemic species, species that exist nowhere else on Earth. Among them, the anoles, like the green tree lizard. Numerous species of birds, like the Jamaican golden oriole. The streamer tail hummingbird. and no less than 500 species of calcium-loving land snails. One of the island conquerors was an inconspicuous crab, which left the ocean about four million years ago and invaded the island. Eventually, species developed that reproduced in fresh water instead of salt water, the Jamaican crabs. During the past 15 years, I have studied these crabs together with my research team, and we have discovered their unusual reproductive behavior. For example, crabs that breed in snail shells, or raise their young in a pineapple plant on a tree. We will follow the route of these tree breeders from the ocean to the treetops, and thus trace the most important locations of their evolutionary pathway. It all began here on the coast. Long before the ancestors of the Jamaican land crabs colonized the island, other crabs had already settled along the coast. These coastal crabs were reliant on the sea, like being trapped in a dead-end street of evolution. The ghost crabs are one of them. They inhabit the sandy beaches, an area where the tides determine their daily rhythm of life. They're the fastest runners among the crabs. With their stalk eyes, they always have a good view of their surroundings. At low tide, they shovel moist sand from the surface of the beach into their mouth and filter the nutrients out of the indigestible sand. 
fiddler crabs also live close to the sea. The female quickly sorts out food from the surface of the sand. The males are clearly handicapped when feeding. They only have one small feeding claw. The second claw is enormously enlarged. Unceasingly, they wave their claw, which is almost half their body weight, to attract females or to impress competitors. A hermit crab, another frequent habitant in the woodlands of the coast. Related to the true short-tailed crabs, the hermit crab, however, has an elongate soft abdomen placed in a protective shell. It shares its habitat with another typical inhabitant of the Caribbean coasts, the black land crab. This rather colourful fellow, in spite of his name, is well adapted to life in the woodlands close to the coast. Gill breathing is a disadvantage in this dry environment. The black land crabs have therefore developed lung-like chambers which are located at the side of the projecting shell. This enables them to breathe in the air. With a shell up to 11 centimetres wide, the white land crab is the largest among the coastal crabs and also occurs in different colours. Large males have a tremendously enlarged claw. They dig burrows up to two metres deep down to underground water but they too remain close to the coast. Ghost, fiddler and land crabs have one thing in common. Their young, the planktonic larvae, can only live and develop in seawater. This female carries more than 100,000 tiny eggs underneath her abdomen. Her reproduction is typical for most other crabs that live near the coast. After copulation, the female releases her fertilized eggs. Under the microscope, the eggs are joined like a bunch of grapes. The embryo develops inside the egg membrane. This one has already fully developed, which is clearly seen from the heartbeat. Soon, the egg membrane will rupture and the so-called zoea larvae will hatch. They can only develop in salty water. Therefore, the female has to migrate to the sea to deliver them into the sea water. Although these crabs have already accommodated well to terrestrial life, they have not yet become independent from the sea. The coastal crabs have not entirely adapted to the land because their larvae can't survive in fresh water. But how does a saltwater crab become a freshwater crab? Their way to fresh water had to lead through an intermediate stage in brackish water, where the larvae could adapt. The ancestor of the Jamaican land crabs made this important evolutionary step probably on the north coast. Here we discovered two species that breed in brackish water, the mangrove crab and the brackish water crab. These species help us reconstruct the colonization of land. The spacious limestone terraces, which are typical of the Jamaican north coast, played an important role. They originate in offshore coral reefs, which emerged from the sea at a rate of about 20 centimeters per 1,000 years. Rain has eroded the limestone and has created a bizarre miniature landscape. Rainwater and splash water from the sea form a large number of brackish pools, which the weak tide of seawater will never reach. These small pools offer an individual habitat to numerous organisms. The brackish water crab regularly visits these pools as a safe place for molting because, like all other crabs, they have to get rid of the old shell in order to grow. The brackish water crab displays a different and interesting behaviour compared with the coastal crabs. Instead of depositing the larvae into the sea, they're released into the rock pools. 
About 3,000 larvae are moving about in this one. But how do they differ from their cousins in the sea? In the Discovery Bay Marine Laboratory, Martina Shu studies the eggs and larvae of the brackish water crab and of species which develop in the sea. The eggs of the brackish water crab on the right are much bigger than those of a closely related sea dependent species on the left. This applies also to the larvae. The larvae of the brackish water crab develop into baby crabs in only two weeks. The ocean larvae take about four weeks. Moreover, the larvae of the brackish water crab are more resistant against physiological stress. Under what circumstances do the larvae develop in the brackish water pools? In order to find out more about this, we investigate the conditions in the pools. Mosquito larvae are developing in this one. The most important difference to the ocean is that within a short time, the salt concentration in the pools can vary extremely while it's stable in the ocean. This pool has 40 ppm, that's slightly more than seawater. In dry periods, the salt concentration in brackish water pools is far higher than in water from the ocean. After a heavy rain shower, however, it's strongly diluted. The larvae of the brackish water crab are very adaptable because they can survive in very high salt concentrations as well as almost fresh water. This means they can survive under conditions that would be lethal for their cousins living in sea plankton. In quick motion, life awakens. Here there's enough food and there are scarcely any predators which go after the larvae. And yet, the deadly danger is always present because this habitat is transient, ephemeral. If it doesn't rain over a longer period of time, the pools dry up. Only pure salt remains. Under these variable conditions, it's important for the larvae to develop quickly. When they become young crabs, they can leave the pool. The brackish water crab demonstrates an important stage of evolution during the colonization of the island. From brackish water to fresh water is only a short way. The mangrove swamps provide the most important contact area between salt water and fresh water. In Jamaica, mangrove swamps are often not very far from the rock pools. Here the land and the ocean meet. Fresh water from the river gets mixed with salt water from the sea and becomes brackish water, an important link to the mainland for many sea-living animals. A turtlefish looking for crabs comes into the mangrove swamp with the weak flood tide. Crabs are the prevailing inhabitants in the tangled root system of the red mangrove. Here is a specially colourful representative. The leaves of the mangroves are their favourite food, but since most of the crabs are poor climbers, they have to wait until the leaves drop off. The mud crab collects leaves and stores them up in her subterranean pantry. The tree crab, by comparison, is a very skilled climber. She gets her food in the canopy. The mangrove crab lives here too. It's closely related to the Jamaican land crabs, whose trail we are following. The larvae of this species develop in isolated mangrove pools and their adaptations are similar to those of the brackish water crabs larvae in the rock pools. It's very likely that the forerunner of the Jamaican land crabs looked similar to this one. 
Anyhow, they, or better the larvae, had the decisive ability to become independent of the sea and invade the fresh water. Mangrove swamps mostly lie in river and brook deltas. On our way to the forest brooks, we come across one of the last timid sea cows in Jamaica, which is looking for food in the river mouth. Waterways connect the ocean directly with the mainland. The Jamaican crabs followed these waterways and quickly conquered the interior of the island. Nothing could stop these sturdy animals. There were no other competing crabs around. They were the first ones in this territory. Now adapted to life in fresh water, the crabs found an ideal new habitat in the brooks. Pure water, rich in oxygen, offers access to food and contains a lot of calcium, which dissolved from limestone. Calcium is an important substance for crabs to build their shells. Crabs inhabited the network of the river and watercourses in Jamaica within a rather short period of time. This freshwater shrimp, originally also a marine inhabitant, has invaded the brooks too. The search for one of the conquerors takes us to the headwaters of the Martha Bray River. This stream has cut deeply into the red soil. The sloping banks are full of holes. These are crab burrows, a real crab city. The widely branching burrows go deep into the soil, many of them even below the water level. At last, a freshwater crab, a relatively small female carrying a cluster of orange eggs. These crabs belong to a new species, and we gave them the scientific name of Sesama fossarum, the burrowing crab. The males of this species have conspicuous red claws. These crabs mainly feed on plant material. Their gill breathing requires water regularly, Therefore, they stay close to the stream when roaming through the forest. Since they don't move too far away from the water, the crab populations in the various river systems are genetically isolated from one another and developed into different species. During our investigations of different river systems, we discovered four new species of these freshwater crabs. It's likely that further unknown species will follow. During the day, the crabs stay within the labyrinth of the burrows which they have dug. Some of the tunnels end up in a chamber. A crab couple lives in this one. The male has the larger claws. Often we find several crabs in such a chamber, a big male with his harem ladies. It's the breeding season. We come across many females with eggs. Their large eggs are rich in yolk. Later on, the larvae will feed on their yolk reserves while they develop well protected in the water-filled chamber. Out in the stream, the larvae would not survive long and would easily become fish food. Only a small amount of water flows above ground in Jamaica. Most of it streams through an extensive network of cast caves. There are more than 1,000 limestone caves on Jamaica. The Windsor Great Cave is one of the largest cave systems on the island. 
An expedition into this system will show whether the crabs have also gone underground. Drip water forms stalactites and stalagmites, bizarre structures that make this cave a beautiful but eerie place. The Windsor Great Cave accommodates a large population of bats. The excrement and skeletons of millions of perished bats result in a layer of guano several meters thick on the floor. Guano is vital for the rich cave fauna. Once we become used to the vast number of flies, we can admire these remarkable cave crickets. Tactile organs are more important than eyes in permanent darkness. They never lose track with their enormously extended antennae, which are in constant motion, an early warning system that makes possible an early escape. The predator lives right amongst them. The whip spider also gropes through the darkness and uses the enormously extended front legs for orientation and prey detection. After searching the cave for several kilometers, we finally discovered this crab, a true cave crab. About two million years ago, the ancestors of this crab followed the rivers and streams below ground. Now they've become adapted to this special habitat. These crabs also have the characteristics of cave dwellers. Their body is covered with long tactile hair, which helps them to feel their way through the darkness. In continuous darkness, vision and body color have lost their importance. The eyes are small and the color of their body has faded. Cave crabs spend their entire life underground. They are excellent climbers and have no problems with steep walls. The crabs prefer caves with clear water. Here they have to cope with a meager supply of food. This crab has found a seed which has been washed into the cave during a flood. This female carries a cluster of large yolk-rich eggs. The yolk supplies the larvae with enough resources to survive in this bare world. But where do they develop? After an intensive search, we found the nursery of these crabs in little drip water pools. Here they develop within one week into baby crabs. These utterly filigree, long-legged creatures are very difficult to find. Cave crabs live a secret life and their reproductive behavior has scarcely been studied so far. These crabs are probably common and widespread over Jamaica because the water-bearing cave systems are most likely connected by a network of underground water veins. The cockpit country in central Jamaica a distinctive wild landscape, more than 500 square kilometers of wilderness with steep, inaccessible karst hills covered with dense rainforest. We have reached our destination. Two interesting species of crabs live in these woodlands, probably the most unusual crabs in the world because of their extraordinary brood care. In order to study them, I have established a small field station out here. My friend Brady, a Jamaican, looks after this station and supplies us with fresh produce from his little farm. The plants and trees in the rainforests grow directly on the porous rocks, practically without a layer of humus. Here rainwater seeps quickly into the soil and remains on the surface for only a short time in little rock pools. And here, in these miniature pools, we discover several crabs. But wait, at second glance we notice that these are only shed crab shells. 
these cast-offs are often to be found. But where are the crabs? And where do they breed? The soil is covered with sharp-edged cast rocks. It becomes very hot and dry during the day on top of the limestone. But underneath, a more favourable microclimate prevails for crabs and other inhabitants. Like this millipede, thick as a finger. It took us several years to solve the riddle. Snails. Land snails find ideal living conditions in these cast areas. Plenty of calcium for the snail shell and lots of hiding places. The big pleurodont snails spend the dry, warm daytime underground where it's cool and moist. In some places, there are countless shells of dead snails, veritable snail cemeteries. Do the crabs hide in snail shells? Indeed, this crab has chosen a very ingenious home. It's the smallest of the Jamaican land crabs and just fits into the opening of a snail shell. Snail shells are of crucial importance in their life. In dry periods, they serve as a home with a cool, humid microclimate. But above all, they serve as a breeding place for the larvae. The snail crabs need to carry a supply of water when they roam about, because they breathe with gills. The life of snail crabs takes place exclusively in crevices under the gravel. Here, life-giving water comes from dew, which settles on the plants in the cool morning hours. The eggs from this female have developed, and soon the larvae will hatch. Now we can watch her engaging in an interesting activity. The female has found a suitable snail shell for breeding, and now water is required for the larvae. She collects dew with special bristles on the side of her body and carries the water into the snail shell. Less than a thimble full of water is sufficient for approximately 10 larvae to develop. There are plenty of yolk reserves in the egg for the larvae and they don't have to feed immediately. In only three days, the colourless larvae have developed into baby crabs. There's a favourable microclimate inside the snail shell, whereas outside the larvae would dry out quickly and die. Nevertheless, the young can't do without their mother in order to survive. The mother protects them from predators, provides water and feeds them. She carries leaves, seeds and fruit into the snail shell and cuts the leaves into small chips. The little ones live, so to speak, in a vegetable soup. Occasionally, the mother returns with a millipede. After about three months, the juveniles are relatively large. The space in the snail shell becomes too small. Now it's time for them to depart and live on their own. Early morning at the Windsor Field Station. The nights are cool here. The humid air has cooled down and covered the plants with dew. This time, I'm on the track of a crab that, in the true sense of the word, reached the apex of the invasion from the sea onto land.
I am now 25 meters above ground in a tree. Here in the world of birds there also exist the bromeliad crabs. They live in bromeliad plants which store rainwater all year round. Their entire life cycle takes place on these plants and they have adapted to this unusual habitat in a special way. On Jamaica, there are also large bromeliad plants on the ground. More than 60 species of bromeliads are found in Jamaica. These plants, which are related to the pineapple plant, are real masters of the art of survival. Their roots only anchor the plant. The food drops from the sky, so to speak, and accumulates on the plant. April. After a long dry period, spring rainfalls begin at last. The bromeliad leaves catch rainwater like a funnel and lead it into the axles. Here the water is gathered into small pools. Rainwater, leaves, blossoms and fruits, the life-supporting cocktail for a special animal world. And finally, here is the bromeliad crab. We're in luck. During daytime, one rarely sees these shy animals. In order to observe the behaviour of the crabs, we have to adapt to their rhythm and search for them at night. The flattened body of the bromeliad crab is an adaptation to life between the narrow leaf sheaths. The bromeliad crab too is a gill breather and needs water to moisten them. Water is pumped from the gill chamber over external bristles. There the water is oxygenated and recycled to the gills. The long-legged crab moves skillfully through the rosette of leaves. The bromeliad crabs are excellent hunters. There's hardly a visitor who's safe from their sharp pincers. This time the crab has caught a cross spider. This red spider also catches its prey on the bromeliad plant, but out of reach of the crab. At the beginning of the year, in January, the crab population gets in motion. It's the mating season. Males leave their bromeliads and visit females in the vicinity. Slowly and carefully, the male enters the territory of a female. With the tip of its claws, he tests the water to see whether the female is willing to mate. The strong pincers are used with the utmost caution on this visit. Everything happens in slow motion. The female, to the left, pushes the male visitor into a corner She's interested in mating. As soon as mating is over, the lover is pushed rudely off the bromeliad. The female has settled in a large bromeliad. Here is everything she needs for living. If all goes smoothly, the female can raise her young here for the rest of her life, which means about two to three years. Now April has come, and the female gives her undivided attention to reproduction. 
For two months, the female carries about 80 eggs. Soon the larvae will hatch, and a strenuous time is to come. But first of all, the female will have to prepare a wet nursery for the arrival of her brood. Many leaves have accumulated, and the process of decomposition uses oxygen from the water and turns it extremely acid, and therefore it becomes a lethal trap for the brood. House cleaning. First of all, she has to remove the leaves from the axle. She's building a nest of water in which the larvae and young crabs will shortly develop. The time has come. The larvae hatch into the cleaned miniature pool. Here they share the axle with the ubiquitous mosquito larvae. Dark pigments protect them from solar radiation. It's also the mating season for the damselflies. They too use bromeliads for breeding. The scars on the leaves prove that the damselfly has laid eggs here. The larvae develop in the axle pool below. Yolk-rich crab larvae are a delicacy for these voracious predators. A single damselfly larva in the nursery of the crabs would wipe out the entire brood. But the mother watches over her young and kills and devours the predator. One and a half weeks later, the critical phase is over for the larvae. Tiny miniature crabs now inhabit the axle. The little ones have to eat and grow now, but there's nothing to nibble in the tidy nursery. Again, the caring mother is called for. The mother maintains a constant vigil on the bromeliad at night. Millipedes chew up the decomposing leaves and frequently visit bromeliads where leaf litter accumulates. She strikes fast. She cuts it into pieces and feeds them to her young. Millipedes are a special delicacy for them. Bromeliad mini water striders benefit from brood care too as they're out for the leftovers. Well taken care of and well protected, the young develop splendidly because mother has solved another problem too. According to my tests, the rainwater in the bromeliad pools is usually extremely acid and does not contain any calcium. Calcium, however, is a very important ingredient for the structure of crab shells. But where do growing juveniles get the calcium from? During my investigations, I often found empty snail shells in the pools. Is this the answer? Where do they come from? I start a test series and stick old snail shells on a leaf near the nursery. Next morning the snail shell has disappeared from the leaf. The mother has indeed carried the snail shell into the nursery. 
Now what happens? Calcium from the snail shell dissolves and this has a buffering effect on acid. The pH has increased to 6.8, ideal conditions for the offspring. This unusual brood care behavior is an adaptation to the severe conditions in the bromeliads. And again, snails play an important role in the life of these crabs. The prospects for a long life and a large number of progeny are favorable for the female as long as she calls a large bromeliad her own. Occasionally, a disaster happens. This female has bad luck. Her home has been destroyed and she has to look for a new bromeliad plant now as quickly as possible. The tranquility is deceptive. The resident female is not pleased about the visit, above all because this visitor claims her breeding territory. She's not impressed by the size of the intruder. No compromise. She throws the opponent decisively off the bromeliad plant. Well protected and well fed, the young prosper. The female has taken care of her brood intensively for more than three months. Now they are large enough to leave their nursery axle and search for food on their own. The excursion does not lead into the inhospitable world outside the bromeliad, but only to the neighboring axles. And here they will stay for another year. Many of them will live to see their mother breeding again in springtime, and will even support her in looking after their younger siblings. We were able to reconstruct the evolutionary steps from marine crabs to tree dwellers. Compared with their marine ancestors, the Jamaican crabs have changed their lives completely. One important key to their success is the effort and care that mothers devote to their young. <laughs>